discipleship series about what it is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And that song we sang tonight, it's amazing how everything just fits in just so well, amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. It's a, it's a terrible indictment of Christianity today that many, many Christians have decided not to follow Jesus. I wish that was not the case. But you look at the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation. Thou sayest thou art rich and have need of nothing and increased with goods and knowest not that thou art poor and naked and miserable. Sad to say that for many Christians today, they've decided not to follow Jesus. They'd rather go their way. They'd rather follow various different things, success, fame, their job, their family. But let me tell you, following Jesus is the best thing you could do. Amen. You see, when you follow Jesus, you get to walk with him. Amen? Amen. And walking with Jesus is the best thing you can do. Amen. Amen. And this is all about looking at being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does it mean to be a disciple of the Lord? Okay, right. I can see a little bit. Right. So we're going to look at what does it mean to be a member of the church? And what does it mean to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? And should we be a part of a local assembly, a fellowship, a group, a group of believers? Uh, one of the, the books I read as a young child was Robinson Crusoe. And that was a guy who was surrounded on a, a, a desert island. And he was there for himself for the most part. And it's sad to say that many Christians have decided, I will get out by myself and it'll be better for me. But sheep always gather. Whenever you see sheep on the hill, they're always very close to each other. And they're always feeding and they're always together. And it's God's plan for his sheep to assemble together. To assemble together. Not to get it off the internet. Not to get it off YouTube. Not to get it out, you know, something else. But to assemble. The Bible says, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 10, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. In fact, the Bible says, as you see the day approaching, and so much the more Amen. as you see the day approaching. So that means we should get together more often. Amen. Amen. Now, I've been in churches sometimes where, where the saints don't want to be around each other that often. Amen. I mean, there's all kinds of bickering and fighting and all the rest of it. But thank God for a church like ours. Amen. Amen. We want to gather together Amen. in sickness and in health. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so we, we want to look at what it means to be part of a local church. And God has established certain things in the Bible. He's established the family. Amen. He's established human government. The Bible says we should pray for our government. And he's also established the local church. And by that, I don't mean a building. Amen. I don't mean anything like that. I mean a group of born again, saved believers who are trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and their will for their lives. So tonight I want to look at the local church. Now, remember, and let me say this right off the, the, the start, that when you get saved... You are placed immediately by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Immediately. And you can't get out. Amen. Amen. You don't have to pay your subscription every year. Or, or else. You're in, the, you're in the body and that's it. Amen. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that you are sealed with that spirit of promise. The moment you believe. And it is true that one day all of God's people are going to gather together. Amen. Amen. We're all going to gather together and we're going to be in, 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 going into heaven and we'll be all, all be together. But in the Bible, the Lord speaks about, and many of the epistles are to local churches. Local fellowships of believers. Many times they are persecuted. Many times they're in dire uh, situations. But they always gather together for prayer, for evangelism, and for a purpose. They weren't just having a coffee morning. They weren't having a, a charity sale or a bazaar. They weren't uh, getting together for Christian aid. They met to hear preaching Amen. and singing. That's the thing about the church in, in the New Testament. You'll find that they, they love preaching, they love singing, Amen. and they love praying. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
And that's three key ingredients to a local church. Uh, so tonight we're going to look at the purpose of the local church. Where we can gather, where our gifts and talents, yes you have some, amen, amen. can be exercised, can be used for the glory of God. So we're going to look at that tonight. So what do we mean by the church? First of all, we're not looking at some spaceship going by, some spiritual entity that, you know, you can't be, do anything with. Although one day we're all gather, it takes local Christians to give out the gospel. Amen. So that's important, amen. Uh, it's not a building. The church might meet in a building. This building is used for various purposes during the week. Sometimes it's used for dancing. Sometimes it's used for storytelling. Sometimes the church of Satan comes here and meets. Yeah. But this is just a building where we gather together. Amen. This building is not the church. Amen. And we can use this church for the glory of God. CH and CH at the end. Unless you, are, unless you have you are in it, you don't have church. Amen. So it's not a building. It's not an organization Amen. with funny handshakes. Okay? With little things they swing back and forth. And, and do this and do that. And do funny things with their hands. It's not an organization. Amen. It's not a club or a society. Amen? Amen? Yeah. It's not a, a great, you know, we get together for our club. Amen? It's not religion. Amen? Amen? You can be religious and not be in a church. Amen. You can be religious and not be saved. Amen. It's not a religion. And I like this one. I added this one. It's not a fun place to be. Well, come to our church because we're fun. We're, we're, we're just lovely people and, and we have lovely times and you can leave with a smile. Amen. Let us entertain you. Spurgeon said, our job as preachers is not to, is not to entertain the goats, but to edify the sheep, Amen. to feed the sheep. You should come to church and you should leave, us, you should leave either sad, glad, or mad. Amen. You should be glad that you're saved. You should be maybe mad at the preacher because he preached on your sin. Amen. Or you should be sad because you see yourself as God sees you. But it's not about having fun. Amen. How many churches? We have a great time. Amen. Oh, we, we really rock it. I went to a church one time. My friend and I, when we were young Christians in Edinburgh, and we went to a church uh, uh, called Crubbers Close in Edinburgh. It's where D.L. Moody preached. Many, many years ago. And we would go there on a, 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 week, a weeknight. We didn't have services. We went along for some Christian fellowship. And we went in one day, and they had this band up the front with the electric guitars and the, 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 the drums and all the rest of it. And they started out, and, and, and the song went, I, I don't know if I can do it right. And big, -da -da, my name is on the rock. My name is on the roll. Let's rock Jesus. And, and all. I thought, oh, time to get here. <laughs> <laughs> That might entertain the flesh. Amen. But God isn't pleased with it. Amen. It's not a building. It's not an organization. It's not a club or society. It's not a religion. It's not a fun place to be. So why do you need to be a part of a local church to follow Jesus? People say all the time, well, well going to church doesn't make you a Christian. That's right. Amen. But going to church helps you follow Jesus better. Bible says, we read in our scripture, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, when it says not to do it, don't do it. If God says you're not to do something, it doesn't matter how wise you are or your situation, don't do it. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Uh, the old saying, if somebody dropped, off, somebody dropped off a cliff, would you jump too? If God says don't, Make sure you do assemble and not to forsake it. Then we ought to assemble together as a church. And as we'll see, if, if you're not there, then part of the body is missing. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If you're not there, would you wake up and go to work tomorrow without your hand? <laughs> without your leg? Without your ears? You'd make sure the whole body was together. And, 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 I, and I say this kindly and as lovingly as, as, as I can. That every time the church meets, we should all meet together. Amen. If we're able to, amen. Not providentially or, you know, sick or something like that. But I'm saying we should meet together. Because we're all part of the body. Amen. 
And if you're not there, the body can't do what it needs to do. So because God says. The New, church, New, the New Testament church is not a building. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 that it's God's purpose and God's will, I believe, for every Christian to be an active member of their local New Testament church. Now, if there's no church in the area or something like that, I can understand you get together with a couple of believers. But if there is a church that preaches the truth with the King James Bible and you're not in it, the only person who's happy is the devil. Because God's plan that you should have uh, part of that so you can exercise, exercise your uh, talents and your gifts. God did not save us to be Robinson Crusoe Christians. I have met so many Christians, well, I don't need to go to church to be saved. That's right. But you do need to assemble to get closer to the Lord. How many people have come to me and said through the years, you know, I started going to church, and although my trials and troubles increased, I started walking with the Lord better. Amen. And there's a reason for that, because God left the church here so that we could be edified, so we could edify one another. Amen. Edification means to build up. God gave us all talents that allow the local church to operate effectively. Amen. You might say, and the devil might come up to you and say, well, it doesn't matter if you go to church. You don't count. We read in our passage of the scripture, if the ear were to say, I'm not of the body, therefore I'm not of the body. What about the leg or the foot? Could, I, could someone come along and chop off your hand and you'd be okay with that? We're all part of the body. So we should all meet together so that the whole body can operate effectively. Have you, have you ever stubbed your toe with a hammer or your thumb? I used to be really bad for that. And before I got saved, when I would, all the curse words would come out. And it seemed like after I first got saved, the Lord allowed things to happen to my thumbs. And so I eventually got to was ah, hallelujah, that hurt. <laughs> But the Bible says if one member suffer, all members suffer. If one member ed is edified, we should all be edified. So we have to make sure our part of a life as a disciple is to be involved in our local church, our local assembly, part of that local body of getting the gospel out. You can do some things, but together we can do far, far more. You can pray... But together, the Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. The Bible also says that if two agree on anything, it shall be done for them in heaven. So when we get together, we can do more, and the devil knows that. So what is church? First of all, according to Hebrews 10.25, it refers to ourselves, at the assembling of ourselves together, the gathering it's not about you waking up in the morning and saying, oh, I think I'll have church in my bed. I used to say a lot, a lot of times, a lot of Christians, you know, they go to the Catholic church on uh, Sunday morning. They listen to the, the message by uh, Father Headboard and they attend St. Mattress. <laughs> oh, I think I'll have church in my bed. Really? The Bible says go not, to, not to forsake the assembly. So we are to assemble together, and that's very important. The Bible also says in Romans chapter 14, verse 19, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. When we come to church, it's not about me. Amen. I mean, say that right off the start. It's not about me. Amen. It's about him. Amen. And it's about edifying each other. Amen. God's called me to be a pastor, but I am not the sovereign of this church. Amen. I am not the Lord of this church. The Lord's the Lord of this church. Amen. I'm just a, an under-shepherd, if you like, who helps to lead the sheep in the right way. It's not about me. It's not about you. Amen. It's about edifying one another. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also ye do. We are to edify. That means to build up, not tear down. How many times have you been torn down by a Christian? Amen. Amen. Some of the worst times I've been cursed out has been by another Christian. I have been cursed out by another Christian. I'm like, 
<laughs> I'm expecting a lightning bolt, you know. It's like, wow. But we are to build up, not tear down. Amen. We are to encourage. We are to be sweet together. You see, there are two things you can do to preserve fruit or vegetables. My wife loves this part. You can pickle them. And she loves pickles. Or you can preserve them and they get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Guess which one I like. <laughs> we ought to get sweeter and sweeter and love each other. Amen. Amen. More and more. Jesus says, they, you, you, they, they, you shall know you by your love. We are to love each other. New Testament church is not there for a building. It's not a building. The New Testament church is the local church, is the continuation of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry while he is in heaven. In John chapter 13, we saw this, how the Lord says, you'll do greater works than me, because he was in that locality. But we can do great works and continue his ministry of getting the gospel, evangelizing, knocking on doors, soul winning. We are part of his ministry. Amen. This isn't John. Let me say this, and let me be. People said this to me, and, and, and it really irritates me. This is not John McLennan's church. Amen. This is the Lord's church. Amen. It's not mine. It's not my church. You know, when, when I was growing up in Scotland, there used to be one guy, and this was years and years ago, one guy would come down with a football. And when he didn't like what was going on, what was going on he'd pick up his ball and go home and say, It's my ball, my game, I'm off. The game's up the pole. The game's a bogey. This is the Lord's. This is His ministry. When you are assembling, when, I, when we are assembling together, we're part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. Of getting the gospel out. The local church is the ministry. It is His body on earth. John chapter 14 verse 12 says, Very, very, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do, also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. So that's important. Now, what do we mean by a Bible-believing church? You see, there's lots of churches out there. And many times Christians are a part of them. But I believe, first of all, a Bible-believing Baptist church, and we'll get into these terms in a wee minute, First of all, the Bible has to be the rule of faith and authority. Amen. And only the Bible, the rule of faith and authority. That's it. We're not appealing to a pope or the so-called church fathers or some theologian or some government department. It's the Bible. Amen. As we sing the song to the children, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. A Bible-believing church doesn't have an organization, a, a, a clergy, a, a laity. It's Bible-based, and Bible is the authority. Now, what do we mean by a Baptist church? Now, I actually don't like to use that term very much, but since it, it identifies, let me clarify what it means. Now, down through the centuries, there's always been groups of believers the Lord said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. So the Lord has always had a people from the time of Christ until today. Amen. They were called by many, many different names. Uh, in Antioch, they were called Christians. Amen. And that was actually a derogatory term. Yeah. They were saying, you're just like a little Jesus. Yeah. And they began to call them Paulicans. They said, well, you're just following that Paul guy. And down through the ages, they call them different names, Albigenses, the Novatians, the Cathary, the poor men of Leon, the Waldensians, and mostly they were called Anabaptists. Because the Catholic Church used to baptize babies, we saw that a few weeks ago, and uh, when the Christians would say, oh no, that baptism is no good, you have to be baptized after you're saved, they used the word Anna to mean re-baptizers. But really, they never got baptized in the first place. So that term struck, stuck, uh, stuck, and as we saw in, in our, our study of that, there was, a, there was a Catholic Jesuit priest who said in, in the, the 1500s, had not the Catholic Church been killing the Anabaptists for the last 1,200 years, they would swarm more numerous than the Protestants. 
So the Anabaptists have been killed down through the ages. Now, I'm not saying that being a Baptist will save you. It won't. But it is an identification that I like. Because it tells people we baptize. And we baptize by immersion those who have been saved. And only those who are saved. So down through the ages you'll find hundreds of thousands, even millions, were tortured, refusing to accept relief and standing for the faith of Christ. And they called them Anabaptists. As we saw and we looked at before in another lesson, Baptists are independent. They don't have a government uh, authority. They are simply there to preach the gospel and get people saved. We're not there to, to change the government. We're not there to do anything like that. Just get people saved. And so a Bible-believing church is a local church that is there to carry out the commands of the gospel to get people saved. Now, being a Baptist won't get you to heaven. Only being saved will get you to heaven. But someone has said, and I like it, if you're going to heaven, why not go first class? <laughs> Amen? Why not go first class? And that's the way I look at it. So we look at the, the local church as being the continuation uh, of, of the, the body of Christ on earth. We see that we're going to see, do greater things. The church is more than just a group or a fellowship gathering together for fun ship. Amen. We're gathered together for a purpose. To glorify the Lord, to preach the gospel, and get people saved, and disciple them. Jesus said, go you into all the world and preach the gospel, uh, teaching them to observe all things, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's it. That's our part one orders. That's what we're to do. It's a group of committed believers who seek to worship and to serve Christ together. It is called a fellowship or a household of the saints. Catholic Church sanctifies people who are dead and calls them saints. But do you know when you're a believer, you're already a saint? Amen. That's why that song says, when the saints go marching in, I want to be a part of that number. So how does God use the local church to accomplish the purpose that he sent forth it to do? First of all, the local church is there to do eight things that we saw before in, in, in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 41. Let's turn there. Acts chapter 2. We saw this when we looked at being baptized. But in Acts chapter 2, we find how we should follow the Lord after we are baptized. And let me tell you, if, if I could get every single person who is born again doing what this says, we would take this country for Christ. Amen. We would. Yeah. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 says this. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they, notice this, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily, I love that, yeah. daily, in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Because of their, exactly, because of their daily activities, people were saved daily. Amen. Amen. So, in order to follow that, we have to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue steadfastly. We are to steadfastly pray. We did that tonight. Minister as a member of the body of Christ. Prefer other members before yourself. Amen. As Jesus did when he washed the feet of the disciples. We are to watch out for each other's spiritual well-being. Amen. Amen. You know what Cain said when God asked him, where's Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? You are the keeper of every Christian here. Amen. We are to prefer one another. Yeah. We are to put each other first. Amen. We are to provide for physical needs. We are to be witness and evangelize for the Lord Jesus Christ wherever we go. Amen. 
We're doing that this week. We looked on Sunday night, witnessing to at least one person every day. Imagine we did that for 365 days. Wow. How many people would get saved? Amen. So many Christians come to church, never witness, never go soul winning, never tell anybody anything, and say, oh, how I love Jesus. Really? Jesus said, go. Amen. We are to be involved. How can you be involved? Well, it says in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. We are to be steadfast. The sad thing is, if you were to look at the life of a lot of Christians, as far as a graph was concerned, it should be starting from saved and going on and on and on with the Lord. But a lot of times it's kind of like this, up and down, up and down, up. How many Christians have you met? They're up, they're down. I'm saved, I'm full of God, amen. Next day, oh, woe is me. Amen. Amen. Stand fast. The Bible says Jesus set his face as a flint. He was steadfast. Amen. We were, when I was in the army, we used to, in Belize, we were in Central America. We stood at a camp, and the camp was at a position. If the Guatemalans ever came in, uh, we were to stop them right there. And the, the camp was called Hold Fast. What did Jesus say? Hold fast that thou hast. We are to be steadfast. We are to hold fast. We are to be involved. God wants us to be involved. God wants us to exercise our spiritual gift. Recently, my wife has, has been going with me to the gym, and she commented today as we went to the gym, you know, I'm feeling so much better. Didn't you? I feel so much better. She said, it's really doing me good. You've got spiritual gifts. Yes, you do. Amen. If you don't exercise them, they're going to be flabby. <laughs> it's like when you exercise I've done a long time you're going to get sores and oh I've got used to that you have to exercise you know how a, a, a young person goes to the gym and wants to be strong they start with little weights and once they're used to that they get bigger weights once they're used to that they get bigger weights once they're used to that they get bigger weights there's a spiritual parallel to that. Start with the little things. Reading your Bible, praying every day, witnessing. Then do more. Then do more. As you exercise your spiritual gifts, you will become stronger spiritually. If you don't exercise them, you won't. What does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait in our ministering, Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8, sorry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. You have a gift. Amen. Amen. You have a talent. It's in there. You might have to unwrap it and look for it, but it's in there. Volunteer. This is a thing you would never do in the army. Volunteer. <laughs> Amen. All those volunteers, one step forward, everyone took a step back. <laughs> and the poor monkey wasn't quick enough. What? What? <laughs> the church gives, in the, ch the Lord gives into the church, pastors and teachers that we might be edified and brought to a mature knowledge of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God gives pastors and teachers. He gives us, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some, and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come into the, in, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I don't really want to say this, but I should say this. A pastor is a gift from God. Amen. I'm nothing. But the Bible says God gave pastors and teachers Amen. to help you to come to a mature knowledge and faith. Now, a pastor is just a, a, an ordinary human being like you and me. But God gave them. 
It's a different gift. And I can't exercise my gift if you're not here. Amen. Amen. God calls pastors to shepherd God's flock. Turn over to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Titus chapter 1. Apostle Paul giving some instructions to uh, Titus. I used to have a friend who was from Crete. He was a Cretan. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> Titus chapter 1 verse 5 says this, For this cause left I thee in Crete. And this is what Paul sent to Titus. This is what he wants Titus to do. This is what a pastor wants to do. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, notice that, not perfect, blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. That's an important one right there. Amen. I've known some people who call themselves pastors who are fighters. Who, if you don't do what they say, they're going to get you and grab you by the throat and put you against the wall. According to that verse, you're disqualified. Amen. Amen. For a bishop, and a, a pastor is also called a bishop or an elder. The bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed. He's not in it for himself. Amen. Not soon angry. Amen. Not given to wine. That means none. Amen. No striker. He's not going to beat you up. Not given to filthy lucre. In other words, got my DVD set? <laughs> got my video? Yeah. Got your seed gift? But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men or good people, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast, the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the, gain, the gainsayers. That's what pastors to do. They are to be teachers of the word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7, Remember them which have the, the rule over you who have spoken to you the word of the Lord, word of God whose faith follow you. Follow. So the Bible says that God has given us uh, elders, pastors, so that we can follow. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Now, part of a church and part of being in a church is also about how we can serve in the church. And you can serve by volunteering and you can also serve by giving. Amen. Now, I'm not just talking about money, as we'll see in a few minutes. I'm talking about yourself. Amen. God wants you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God, love, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Jesus said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Amen? I have, we were over in Brother Tommy's a few weeks ago, and he said, You know, I keep giving to the Lord, and he keeps throwing it back at me. <laughs> Amen? I've seen that in my life. Yeah. Amen? The principle of giving is a way that we can serve God. Now, I'm not talking about you giving an, a certain amount of percentage. Yeah. Amen. I'm talking about you giving it all Amen. to the Lord and then asking him, how much do you want me to keep? Amen. Matthew, Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44 says this, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow... And she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Amen. You know what God wants? He wants your heart, Amen. not your wallet. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 20 verse 35 says this, I have showed thee in all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than receive. And that's true, amen. 
I used to have, a, again, that friend of mine I used to have in, in uh, Edinburgh uh, called Peter. And when I was the first Christian, he'd all, we'd sit in the back, and, 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 and with the offering we'd go by, he'd nudge me and say, you faint and I'll carry you out. <laughs> so he could avoid the offering. <laughs> we ought not to be afraid of offering ourselves or our talents or our treasure for the Lord. Amen. The reason why we have an offering is not so that I could get rich or you could get rich. The reason why I have an offering is as an opportunity you, or an opportunity for you to serve the Lord. Second Corinthians 8, 5. Let's turn there. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. We're almost finished. Second Corinthians chapter 8. We'll start from verse number 2, just to give us a little bit of context. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 says this, How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, at the notice this, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Amen. Meditate on that for a little bit. These were poor people. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The poor saints at Jerusalem were in, in, in economic and in, 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 in persecution, so the churches, the Gentile churches, took up offerings sent through Paul and others to help their brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. Okay? Look at verse number 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. You ought not to give anything in the offering until you've given yourself to the Lord. Please don't put a penny in the offering until the Lord has all of you. Amen. If he doesn't have all of you, don't put anything in. Because he wants you. He wants your heart. He wants all of us. So we see that, you know, the Bible says it's more blessed to give uh, than it is to receive. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says also that we are to be steadfast. We are to keep going. He says, I've showed you all things, how that you uh, laboring ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. One of my favorite verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain Amen. in the Lord. When we gather together, it's not in vain. When we gather together to preach the gospel, it's not in vain. They might laugh. They might joke. They might curse. They might get angry, but it's not in vain. Amen. When we gather together, it's not in vain. And you being a part of a local church is not in vain. We're all needed. We're all part of the body. We all help the body to do what the body needs to do to get the gospel out. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the study on the local church, Lord. It's where we can use our talents, our gifts. We can edify one another. And Lord, most of all, we can glorify you in all things. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Any questions?